Um, what we're going to talk about is this is a summary of a uh, extended duration pilot that was funded through the Ohio Water Development Authority last summer. And the award was actually given to Mercer County. It was actually given to Mercer County, which is maybe an hour and a half south of here. And it's, it contains the largest concentration of livestock operations within the state of Ohio. And it's one of the top 10 within the nation. So what I'm gonna, basically a high level overview. And that's, how, that's what it looks like if you go backwards. Okay, what we're trying to deal with, what we're trying to deal with are two things that are happening today. The consequences of excessive nutrients entering a watershed. This is actually a satellite image of the Western Basin of Lake Erie out there um, during the Toledo water crisis. All right, but it is very common with what you would see varying degrees now. And you add to that the high price of fertilizers. This is actually through September of 21. If you were to carry it out through this year already, you would see that nitrogen is going up even higher. So you've got a concern about excessive nutrients, but yet you've got to buy nutrients. People are buying nutrients. So what that's created is an environment where people are starting to rethink how do they deal with, you know, this excessive manure or these excessive nutrients. I go to a farm. My wife says I'm weird. I look in a deep pit in a swine operation and I see opportunity. She thinks I'm crazy, but the point is, is there are a lot of nutrients out there that can be monetized or taken advantage of. So that's what we were trying to demonstrate. The technologies that we evaluated uh, have been evaluated in a number of different installations across the greater central part of the U.S. Uh, the red are the agricultural applications, yellow industrial, green is municipal. And we're dealing, to put it in perspective, when you talk about phosphorus levels, the question earlier about the, the loading in agriculture is considerably higher than municipal. A municipal discharge, if you're at, you know, most of the standards today are around one one to five, something like that. When we start to deal with some of these industrial clients, you're talking about their discharging levels of 10,000 PPM or 10,000 milligrams per liter. When you deal with swine, you're talking multiple thousand, you're talking grams per liter. Now, in addition to this, what's going on in the US, we're not the only ones looking at this. There are evaluations going on in York, which is on the east side of Toronto, Montreal, and also in the UK. All of them focused around how can you recover phosphorus? So we really involved three different technologies for this pilot. A condensure rotating disc. It's a very simple rotating disc for screening the initial manure. We pulled manure directly from a deep pit operation. No polymers. The manure concentration or, or solids content was roughly five to 6%. So it was a very you know, robust, stout manure stream. If you do with dairy, you're gonna deal with something very similar to that. Quick wash was the, did the heavy lifting. It is actually a suite of technologies, USDA patented suite of technologies that in the case of phosphorus, recovers phosphorus in the form of an amorphous calcium phosphate. It's a multi-stage process that allows you to really tune your solution. And then for dewatering, we looked at two, we physically tested two different technologies. First one were geobag or geotextile materials, uh, where basically you feel a textile bag, you let it drain out, and then you have your solids left over. And we also looked at a uh, device, an Ecoton disc press, which is again, it's like a rotating screw press, all right? Uh, it's based out of the Akron area, is our U.S. operation, so it was very convenient. In addition, in addition, we looked at two other sent samples, to two other different types of mechanical devices, uh, MSD belt filter press and an EvoClaw plate and frame. This is just a 
couple of pictures of the where the phosphorus reduction was going on or recovery was occurring. It's nothing more than a 53 foot stock trailer. They're based out of North Carolina. Go figure, that's where you get your stock trailers. And um, it's been retrofitted to be able to test a wide range of different streams. In terms of the KDS, this is the KDS machine. And that's the actual manure coming off of it. Like I said, the manure was pumped directly to that device, ran across it, no polymers. That's the amount of material that came out of it. That material was collected for evaluation by a third party off taker. And then when we started to look at the geo bags, we were actually storing them. And the Ecoton press is just like this. Now, Talking about the results, when we talk about the initial screening, this is where the manure is coming out of the pit and it's running through the KDS, the condensa machine. There are three different levels of how dry you can make that cake. And there's a direct relationship between how dry you make it and how much throughput you get. If you make it drier, you're gonna get less throughput. So we were actually running at the middle level, the plate, but this is an initial study we did looking at the percent of solids, uh, the P2O5 level, and also the, the ammonium levels. Now, I wanna just state that again, without any polymer, we were getting roughly a 19 to 20% cake. So it was stackable. That material went off 20 yards of that went off to an off taker in the Cleveland area. The filtrate, the liquid that came off of that you got your solids that go out the chute. The liquid is collected below. That's what was treated for phosphorus. And regardless of how we set, how dry we made the cake, the stream coming in for phosphorus recovery was fairly consistent. And uh, I apologize, these are in pounds per thousand gallons. But still, when you look at the phosphorus load, uh, the P205, you're running roughly 23, 24. And on ammonium, you were up around... 51, 52. Now, when we talk about phosphorus recovery, this is where we took that liquid, we sent it into the trailer and we treated it. During the course of the, the program, we ran a total of roughly 100, 110,000 gallons. We averaged 96% on total phosphorus recovery, but an important measurement is on the soluble phosphorus we were covering 98%. And that was without being aggressive. That was really tuning back the process. And this is what our flow pattern looked like. And these are the actual numbers. Um, and I apologize for the, the jagginess. The point is the blue is what the water, the phosphorus level coming in, and the orange is what we were treating going out. This data was measured in the trailer by my crew but we weekly send samples to a third party lab for validation. And to put the, in perspective, this is a time frame where we did the mechanical evaluations, which is why you saw the slight drop in the flow. Now, when you look at the recovered phosphorus, a geotube, if you had a good one, you'd get a bag that would look like this, you'd cut it open, it would sit there for a while, you'd cut it open and you get a material that you could play with. Your grain kids would love it. They'd get in there and it's just something, something to play with. On the mechanical system, we were actually generating a stackable product at average roughly 23, 24% solids. And it's just collected in that form. And the intent is to then negotiate or work with an off taker. What form does he need it in? Does he need it dried? Does he need it pelletized? How does he want to do it? How does he want to manage it? Of the material, three tons were sent to Fort Wayne, various off takers there for use. And another roughly uh, 30 yards was actually field applied, a large wheat field in the, near the test site. This is what the typical analysis looked like. Comparing the geotube to the mechanical system. And in the case of the geotube, we had 28 bags that we filled. Each bag was holding roughly 7,500 gallons of slurry would be pumped into them. And we did 23 evaluations on the mechanical. 
Overall, the GeoBag was not as good in terms of getting us a stackable product. Uh, they have, it has to sit for a long time. It takes a lot more polymer to get to that state. So you know, reading ahead, the GeoBag is not a cost-effective solution, okay? On the mechanical side, we were consistently around 23, 24%. But if you look at the total nitrogen, the P205, and the available phosphorus levels, you can see that they were all fairly, fairly consistent. Um, we were averaging 74, 75% plant available phosphorus, which is good from a fertilizer standpoint. And potassium was consistent across the two of them. When you look at the economics, we compared the summer of 2021 last year, we were averaging 96% on phosphorus recovery at an average cost of less than half a, well, roughly half a penny per gallon treated. Our target was we had to be competitive with land application. Land application in this area, there's a lot of factors that influence that, but typically you're running at a penny to a penny and a half for typical land application costs. And we were below that. That compares very well, very well with a Farm Bureau pilot that was conducted in the summer of 2019 at a large uh, swine operation. This was part of the Blanchard demonstration farms where we also got greater than 95% on swine and the same almost approximate cost. Now in all fairness, these costs do not include the cost to dewater the material, which in the case of the geotube was roughly five cents a gallon. Again, it's not competitive. On the mechanical, depending on how we ran the system, we're a little over a penny and a half to up to three cents. Since then, laboratory testing has shown we should be able to hit a penny a gallon for that, putting us the combined total cost within the range of land application, which is what we were shooting for. The other important thing to note is this does not include the value of the product. Okay, we have to be competitive without any consideration of the value of the product for it to really to make a, an impact. So, so what are we doing next? We were awarded a conservation innovation grant. Uh, it was actually awarded to Allen County, Indiana. Uh, which is where the Maumee Water Valley, the Maumee Watershed Authority is based out of. It's on the Indiana side of Toledo. It, it touches on the fringes of the watersheds feeding into the Lake Erie uh, watershed, where we're going to be dealing with multiple operations and we're going to be more involved, involving off takers to help us quantify and value add value or define the value of that co-products. And our goal is to target a net cost of less than, you know, roughly a penny a gallon. We were also awarded another Ohio grant dealing with ammonia recovery. And I'll talk about that shortly. The goal of this, these projects this summer are to look at the value of the various co-product streams that are produced. This is out of a swine operation they're gonna be able to produce screen solids, the precipitated phosphorus product, you've got the value of the treated water, and then you've got ammonia. Now, the reason we're looking at ammonia, one of the things we did in this project is after we pulled the phosphorus out, we wanted to compare the value of that water or the characteristics of that water against other common lagoon-based water systems that are used to support center pivot irrigation. One thing really stood out, and that's on ammonia, okay? Uh, the ammonia coming off of our host farm, which was a deep pit operation, 24 you know, pounds per thousand gallons. Phosphorus was within the range, potassium was a little higher. So ammonia represents an opportunity for additional resource recovery for the uh, producer. How we do that? It's really very simple. This is an example of data that came out of that farm. This is what the raw water looked like. This is what the filtrate looked like after we had precipitated out the phosphorus. What did that water look like? And this is what the resulting cake looked like. 
if you notice the high level of ammonium. Now, there's a fairly common principle. I'm sorry, the other thing I want to point out is the pH on each one of those. pH coming in from the pit was roughly 8. The filtrate was coming out at around 8.7. Same with the cake. There's a well-known relationship between ammonium and ammonia, just so we're all on the same page. Ammonium is the liquid form, if you will, of ammonia. This is at a constant temperature. It's very pH dependent. The equilibrium point is roughly nine and a quarter. When you get to a pH of nine and a half or nine and a quarter, roughly 50%, and this is all at 20 degrees C, roughly 50% of the ammonium will convert to ammonia and become gaseous. If you do nothing more than increase that pH, you precipitate out your phosphorus. Now you've got a stream that's fairly clean. If you raise that pH closer to 10, you're gonna get a very high percentage of the ammonium will convert to ammonia. And then to prove that, we took a sample of filtrate that had the phosphorus removed. And in the laboratory, we were able to show a 97% recovery of ammonia. And what we basically do is you take that stream that's had the pH raise, you flow it across a gas permeable membrane, a gas permeable membrane, which only allows, it's hydrophobic, so only gaseous material will flow. If you've got an acid flowing in there that ammonia is soluble in, you're gonna end up with ammonium salt. If you use sulfuric acid, you'll get ammonium sulfate, citric acid, you'll get ammonium citrate, um, acidic acid, you'll get ammonium acetate. You use nitric acid, you're gonna get the DHS showing up at your door, wanting to know why you're producing ammonium nitrate. And to show you what that means, this is the raw data on phosphorus and ammonia. After we did the phosphorus recovery, still you've got a fair amount of roughly 3,200 ppm of ammonia. After you do this recovery, you're down to this level. So, in summary, um, we've been able to demonstrate that we were able to consistently achieve a reduction or a recovery of 96% of the phosphorus, 98% of the soluble in a steady state operation. Uh, the phosphorus was recovered in the form of a high phosphorus co-product. Operating costs of roughly 0.6 cents per gallon uh, without including the cost of dewatering or the value of the product. And the initial recovery, that says 99%, it should be 97% um, of ammonium is possible as well. So with that, thank you. So yes. On a pound of nitrogen, no, I don't know. I, mean, I just haven't run those numbers. I know that our initial costs is roughly two cents a gallon. That, that's on a total cost, a TCO basis over a 10 year period with a 5% interest. So it's roughly two cents a gallon. If you look at the price of nitrogen right now, that's you know roughly 50, 60 cents a gallon. So it, the potential is there. It's, it's easy when you're dealing with the laboratory setting. Nothing against the academics, I apologize for that. It's when you get out in the real world, how do you make it work in a, in a way, in a form that's usable to a producer? That's what we're gonna be doing this summer. Thank you.